I feel like they are angry because we are coming out here as lazy Nigerian youths to ask f to protest because it's our right to exercise now. Why are you shooting yeah, at us? Yeah, Why are you shooting at us? I mean, just started though. We just like we will still tackle Bari. He has been a bad boy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He has been a bad boy. Yeah. I was coming. I live in Okota and I was, I was, I was coming here. The roads are bad. No lights. Education zero. Yeah. And we are just asking for you to stop killing us. We just want to live. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is April and welcome to my YouTube channel, April N. Today's video is a special video which I'm dedicating to a very serious and important topic that is currently ongoing in Africa, specifically Nigeria. The reason why I decided to make this video is because I have been seeing a lot of questions and I have been asked a lot of questions by people regarding what is going on and how possible or how feasible it is for international bodies international organizations and even for states to intervene in the situation that is going on as of now the president of Ghana, nana akufuado has gone on twitter to make a statement regarding the situation but before this happened and to be quite frank even now there are still questions concerning whether or not his statements could count as an intervention into the affairs that are happening in Nigeria. So today I'm going to be given a general overview of the law regarding intervention into the affairs of a sovereign state and I'm going to be primarily focusing on international legal instruments that is treaties and conventions which are primarily applicable to the African continent so that is the African Union and the ECOWAS because the country that we are talking about is Nigeria which if you're not aware is located in West Africa and is a member state of ECOWAS. Before we get into this video I would like to just make it clear that I'm not a lawyer but I am a law graduate and I did study the law and I would also like to make it clear that, that it is impossible for me to state everything regarding this issue in this video i'm just going to give a brief overview of the events that happened in case you're not aware of, of what actually happened in nigeria and also i'm going to be going into the laws that are relevant to the situation regarding intervention and what exactly can ECOWAS, can the aun can nana kufado do in the situation that has occurred in nigeria and of course if you have no background in the law i would also like to make it clear that when it comes to legal issues there is usually not just one side but there are multiple sides to one particular scenario and every statement that is said is usually open to argumentation this is perfectly normal and it happens in a lot of situations concerning the law so i would definitely like to hear your opinions and your views on the subject matter and also your comments on what i have to say in this video in the comment section down below so i'll be watching out for your comments now let's get straight into this video so the very first thing i would like to establish is what actually happened in nigeria so the whole situation in nigeria concerns the sars that is the special anti-robbery squad which was actually established to deal with certain crimes concerning robbery motor vehicle thefts kidnappings and other like crimes but over the years, SARS has actually become known for severe human rights violations against the civilian population of Nigeria. So there have been a lot of allegations over the years against SARS for extrajudicial killings, torture, extortion, kidnapping, and in some cases, even rape. Most of these extrajudicial acts were centered on the youths, so mainly Nigerian youths were targeted. Now, naturally, all of these alleged actions created a massive unrest in Nigeria, and this led to a series of protests, peaceful protests, in Nigeria, and in fact, even worldwide. There are people in London, New York, Toronto, basically all over the world. People have also joined in the protests against SARS and its actions. The movement that came up is called the NSARS movement, the hashtag NSARS movement, which is what I'm sure most of you guys have heard of. It is very, very strong on social media, especially on Twitter, on Instagram, even on Facebook. So basically across all social media platforms. And the primary goal of the protests and the movement was to shut down SARS as a police unit and reform the whole police force. So after a while of these protests, the president of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari, who is now quite famous on Twitter, if I should say so, he took the decision to officially dissolve SARS. And this was done. And to replace SARS, there was created the police unit called SWAT. Another problem then arose with SWAT because protesters were not satisfied with this replacement of SARS by SWAT. To them, it was basically just a change of name of an oppressive police unit. 
So what protesters actually wanted was accountability. They wanted justice, an investigation into police misconduct, and they also wanted the release of protesters, some of which had been detained during the times that they were protesting. So basically overall, the protesters just wanted justice and accountability from the government. And on 20th October, 2020 at 7 p.m., these protesters had peacefully assembled in Lagos in the wealthy suburb called Leki. They were holding Nigerian flags. They were singing the national anthem. They were just peacefully assembled. They weren't doing anyone any harm or causing destruction or damage to public property or anything of that nature. And then at the Leki toll gates, which is where a lot of the protesters had assembled. The street lights went out suddenly. Suddenly the CCTV cameras, that's the security cameras, were disabled. And then the shooting began. So what was reported was that there were men dressed in military camouflage attire who were just shooting at the protesters and basically murdering people on the spot. Some people reported that before this happened or even during these happenings, there were certain people who were identified as thugs who were paid allegedly by the Nigerian government to come and cause destruction or commotion and pretend or make it seem like they were doing so as protesters. So they came to impersonate protesters in order to cause destruction, commotion and to make it seem like there was a reason for the men dressed in the military attire to open fire. But a lot of eyewitnesses have made it clear that these people were not part of the protesters and that they came and being accompanied by officially dressed government personnel. And after all of this happened, the Nigerian army came out on Twitter to say that all of these reports were fake news. Meanwhile, the whole world got evidence of everything that happened because of Instagram live streams and people reporting things that were happening live. And there have also been credible accounts from eyewitnesses as reported by Amnesty International of the events that actually occurred on the ground. And in fact, the Lagos state governor even went on record to say that, that there have been no deaths, which again was quite problematic because people literally saw evidence of dead bodies lying on the streets of Lagos and people being shot on the spot and killed, shot and killed on the spot. So this has been the large major event that has occurred in Nigeria with regards to the protests and the SARS and the SWAT movement. And of course, naturally, this has created a lot, a lot of commotion worldwide. People have been going out on social media and talking about this and condemning the acts that have been done by the military, by the thugs, by the governments, because the federal government controls the army and the president of Nigeria, President Buhari, is the commander-in-chief of the army. So at the end of the day, he is the one who is going to take responsibility for all the events that have occurred. And of course, another issue that arose, which is actually the main point of this whole video, is how the presidents of other African states or how African organizations handled all the events that were occurring in Nigeria. So the main platform for all of these grievances was Twitter. And a lot of people were of the opinion that the president of Ghana, President Nana Okufuado, had to publicly condemn the acts which occurred in Nigeria, at least through Twitter or any other platform. And other people people were also saying that that would amount to him intervening in the internal affairs of another state in this case which would be Nigeria and that he couldn't do that for political reasons etc 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 so I'm going to be focusing strictly on the law especially with regard to the international organizations that is ECOWAS and the African Union and just to also put it out there the president of Ghana, Nana Okufuado, happens to be the chairperson of ECOWAS. He has been in office since June 2020 till present. So first of all, of course, I would like to state that under customary international law, there is the principle of non-intervention, which basically dictates that a sovereign state cannot interfere in the internal affairs of another sovereign state. And this principle is based on the principle of the territorial sovereignty of states. And of course, the question here would then be what exactly is intervention? And Oppenheim, who happens to be one of the leading scholars in international law, defines intervention to be the forcible or dictatorial interference by a state in the internal affairs of another state calculated to impose certain conduct or consequences on that other state. So basically, this is the definition of intervention. We have several different kinds of intervention, and just to make it clear right now, the main topic of our discussion is a tweet. So basically just putting out a statement to the public condemning particular actions that were done 
by a police unit of another country. So the question here is, would making a formal statement on social media like Twitter condemning what happened in Nigeria, would that amount to an intervention in the internal affairs of Nigeria? That is the question here. NAS was identified by the International Court of Justice in the military and paramilitary activities in and against the Nicaragua case. We have two kinds of intervention, that's the direct intervention and then the indirect intervention. Direct intervention is quite straightforward and it is what Oppenheim primarily was referring to in his definition of intervention. It is basically forcible intervention by dictatorial means or with the help of the military. So it can be in the form of a military occupation. It can be in the form of a blockade. It can be in the form of seizure of assets of another state. Also the arrest and detention of foreigners, expulsion of diplomats, things of this nature. This would be the direct intervention, which obviously in this case did not occur and was not what people were talking about when they wanted the president of Ghana or the AU or ECOWAS to somehow should I say intervene? Indirect intervention can take the form of an economic intervention, a diplomatic intervention, or even a subversive intervention. When it comes to subversive intervention, which I guess would be the most probable kind of intervention that you can allege in situations where a president or an organization goes to the media to condemn a particular act that occurred in a sovereign state, because subversive intervention is basically intervention that is conducted through the radio, through TV shows, with the message of trying to incite revolt or to incite violence or promoting illegal activities. Economic intervention happens with the use of embargoes, interferences with trade and shipping, sanctions, embargoes and the like. Diplomatic interventions are generally not even considered illegal even though they can be unfriendly especially if there is an element of coercion that is attached to it. And in fact it might even be possible to say that what the president of Ghana did based on the tweets that he eventually put out there was a form of diplomatic intervention when he stated that he had a conversation with the president of Nigeria. So in that case, that could be considered as a friendly diplomatic intervention, which is really not illegal. So if we evaluate all of these types of intervention, I believe it's safe to say that posting a tweet on social media or making any formal public announcement or post condemning the activities that were taking place which resulted in the violation of human rights of the Nigerian population would obviously not count as a violation of the non-intervention principle under international law. Next, we come to ECOWAS, that is the Economic Community of West African States. And basically, ECOWAS was originally formed to promote some sort of self-sufficiency between West African states. So the foundation of ECOWAS is primarily as an economic and trading unit. But at the same time, ECOWAS is also the peacekeeping force of like the whole West African region. And when there have been instances of political unrest or instability in certain West African states, ECOWAS has stepped in. We have seen this happening in Guinea-Bissau in 2012. We have even seen this happening with regard to the Malian War in 2013. And we even saw it in Gambia in 2017. So yes, ECOWAS has deployed its peacekeeping force forces to particular West African countries when there have been instances of internal unrest or civil war or other similar situations. So I'm referring to the revised ECOWAS Treaty, which was actually signed in 1993. And if you look at Article 4G of the revised ECOWAS Treaty, you specifically see how one of the basic fundamental principles of the treaty is the recognition, protection and promotion of human rights that are contained in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Now, if we look at the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and we see Article 11, which I would insert somewhere here, it basically gives individuals the right to freedom of assembly. So the freedom to convene in particular areas and whether it's for demonstration purposes or for protesting purposes, as long as it is peaceful, it is lawful and every individual has the right to the right of assembly. So this happens to be one of the fundamental principles as well of the ECOWAS Treaty since the African Charter on Human, on Human and People's Rights was referred to. And then if we look at one of the protocols to the ECOWAS Treaty, that concerns conflict prevention, resolution, management, peacekeeping and security. Article 1H specifically guarantees the rights that are contained in the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. And it states that all the member states of ECOWAS have to guarantee these rights. And as we've already mentioned, Article 11 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights guarantees the rights to freedom of assembly, which includes the rights to peaceful protest 
and the rights to peaceful demonstrations as well. And then the protocol itself under Article 1J guarantees the right to the freedom of association and the rights to organize peaceful demonstrations. And then when it even comes to the imposition of sanctions, Article 45 of the protocol specifically states that if there is a situation of massive violation of human rights in a member state, ECOWAS has the right to impose sanctions. So despite the fact that the principle of non-intervention does exist, the member states of ECOWAS have signed on to certain obligations and to certain principles by themselves which they are bound to follow and they themselves have accepted the fact that certain sanctions can be imposed on them if they are in violation of certain human rights norms or certain obligations under their under the treaty so in this case obviously we can see that ECOWAS does have some power even though of course it is limited by other considerations maybe even political considerations which i'm not going to get into but generally speaking the minimum of a formal public statement would not counts as any intervention into the internal affairs of Nigeria. And now we can move to the African Union and how the Constitutive Act of the African Union and how it addresses situations like, like the one that has occurred and is currently occurring in Nigeria. So when it comes to the Constitutive Act of the African Union, straight away in the preamble, we see the importance of the protection and promotion of human rights. And then when we move to Article 3, of the Constitutive Acts of the African Union. We also see the objectives of the Union and the promotion and protection of people's rights as espoused under the African Charter on Human and People's Rights happens to be one of the objectives of the Union. And now we come to the principles of the Constitutive Acts of the AU and this is a very interesting point because it specifically mentions the word intervene. Article 4H specifically gives the right of the union to intervene into a member state if there has been a decision of the assembly of the AU with respect to grave circumstances which mostly concern international crimes and when it comes to article 4h of the constitutive act where we see certain international crimes enumerated we can refer to the definition of these international crimes from the rome statute of the international criminal court so if we look at article 6 7 and 8 of the rome statute of the icc we will see the definitions of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes so when it comes to the crime of genocide i'm reading here what does it entail it entails any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national ethnical racial or religious group as such killing members of the group causing serious bodily harm or mental harm to the members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent deaths within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Then when it comes to crimes against humanity, again, here are some of the acts which would be classified as crimes against humanity, but they have to be committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. So here are some of the acts, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, or forcible transfer of population, imprisonment or other severe deprivation of physical liberty, in, vi in violation of fundamental rules of international law, torture, rape, sexual slavery, and forced prostitution and the like. So there are lots of acts which can be classified as crimes as crimes against humanity as long as they are committed in a systematic and widespread manner against any civilian population and then of course we come to war crimes which are being primarily handled by the geneva conventions so this is primarily in the context of war which again international humanitarian law primarily deals with this aspect but it includes certain acts like willful killing torture inhuman treatment willfully causing serious suffering or serious injury to the body or to the health, extensive destruction and appropriation of property. So I believe that if we look at some of the acts that have been committed, especially when it comes to the international crime of genocide and crimes against humanity, we will see certain things which, based on the allegations that have been put forth against SWAT and considering what happened recently in Nigeria, could be classified actually as crimes against humanity or even genocide. SARS was actually accused of certain actions like, for example, torture, 
rape, illegal detention of persons, causing serious bodily or mental harm, killing members or targeting members of a specific group, which in this case would be the youth of Nigeria. And if the Assembly of the African Union determines this, that genocide war crimes or a crime against humanity has been committed, then it can intervene into the internal affairs of Nigeria. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. I have briefly gone over the law as it relates to intervention and non-intervention, primarily focused on African international bodies and organizations, and in the African context with regard to the situation concerning SARS and SWAT, and the shooting massacre that occurred in Lagos recently. But from everything that I have spoken about, I think it's safe to say that making a public formal statement on social media by a president of a fellow West African state is by no means an intervention into the internal affairs of the state in question. And there is currently a petition against the president of Nigeria, Buhari, to answer before the International Criminal Court for the alleged crimes that have been committed against the Nigerian population. And I would encourage you guys to sign this petition if you believe in this cause, which I hope you do, because I believe everybody should believe in this cause, considering everything that has happened. I'll leave the link to the petition in the description box down below. And so this brings us to the end of this video. I hope you have enjoyed this video and I hope that you have also learned something in this video. Once again, I would encourage you guys to use the comment section to comment your whole opinion on this issue and also to add on to what I have already said in this video, especially if you have a background in law or you are a lawyer. And I hope to see you guys in another video. So until then, bye.